After the Battle of the Diamond in Armagh, Northern Ireland in 1795, and as a result of it, many Catholic and Presbyterian families came down and settled in this region, particularly from here to Mulafari at Killala. And in some way it would be to many of those families that I would give the credit in culturising us, for many of those families that came and settled here were spinners, weavers and millers. They brought with them the ability to process flax on a commercial basis, and the linen then was taken in and sold at linen markets in our towns, particularly Bellina, Castlebar and Westport. The 19th century then, seeing many of the girls educated by the nuns in spinning and weaving, lace and crochet making, knitting, and government to some degree subsidised that effort and families bought spinning wheels and looms and by the 1950s knitting machines. And this here is a knitting machine from Balmullet and North Mayo knitting those born in jumpers which were exported mainly to the States. My mother-in-law on the other hand was a cottier in Swinford meaning she didn't own any land but she made her living by hand knitting and those gansies then were often worn by fishermen who had their own distinctive chrises and patterns, and after they lost their lives, they were identified from the chris of the pattern on the Gansey. This lady is my aunt, and she immigrated to America when she was 15. She was a cook and seamstress. She died about 20 years ago, and had never come back home. Those two lads are my two uncles, who got rubella when they were born, as a result were deaf and mute, and served their time then as two tailors. They live now? They died in 1918, the flu. When our clothes became warden, mother cutting out the good pieces, sewing all of the good pieces then together to make a blanket for our bed. Mm. Flour coming in those sacks and those sacks when empty were opened up and sewn together to make sheets, pillowcases and much of your clothes. And of course the Irish have a sense of humour about things and we can have a laugh from time to time as well about some of the things even though we're serious at the time. <laughs> in earlier times the brand name of the flower was engraved in ink on the bag. Mother had steeped in washing soda for a few days and then the girls when it went from school on a Saturday or Sunday they spent the day at the river of the lake to wash the brand name out. But even with their best efforts they'd never get the transfer out. The transfer was always there. And there were two companies in this region who marketed flour rather aggressively. One was Pollock Finns at Ballasadere in County Sligo, mm. who marketed their flower under the brand name Purity, Cock of the North and Pride of the West. Mm. <laughs> and then we had Murphy Brothers down in Bellinay, marketing theirs under Moy Rose and Early Dawn. So you can imagine those brand names engraved in ink on the bag. And that is why it is said when the lads, Saturday night of course, uh, there was no socialising on a Saturday night. Uh, you got washed on Saturday night so that you didn't have the map of Ireland around your ears for Mass on Sunday. <laughs> and then Sunday you were a nice clean boy or girl. You could go dancing or to go to the pictures on a sa Sunday night. But of course when you went dancing, the boys were on one side of the hall and the girls on the other. And when the music started, there was a stampede across, will you dance please? Mm. And of course you may refuse because you had somebody else lined up. Mm. So of course we won't go into your private life as to ask you what you've done. <laughs> but anyway, of course he may have left you home. And whatever. But, and uh, the following day, of course, the man goes to work at 10 o'clock when he's having his break. He's discussing the night before in the Pam Court. And he's saying, who did you shift last night? Was it purity or cock in the north? Right? So it is amazing really that there were heaps of those little antidotes in relation to the, se uh, to the selling of flower catchphrases that we look at in a different meaning. But flower bags was an unbelievable part of Irish life. And there were very few houses that it didn't feature in. Let it be rich or poor. And why wouldn't it feature? Because it was 100% cotton. 100% Cotton. Used for pillowcases. Pillowcases and sheets. There you have it. Touch it there. Come over here and touch it. See how soft as that is. That's flower bags, right? And what backside wouldn't like that around it? You know, that's the reality of it. You know, it's amazing really about it. When we look at that in today's terms, people say they make nappies out of them. And people laugh about that. We could only dream of that today. And when you think of it, the diapers today take 300 years to disintegrate and break down. Mm. Nappy, 300 years to disintegrate and break down. It's unreal. Every we house had a bag of flour. Hmm? Mm. Every house had a bag of flour. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and four, every day. And four, 400 wet bags made a big double sheet. Four mm. bags. Mm. 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 Six, six half a hundred bags. It took six of those ones to make a double sheet per bed. Mm. Right? Mm. Amazing. Mm. Those people involved in tweed went around selling door to door and if you purchased from them the making of a suit you could rest assured then that within a few days another woman or a man arrived offering to sword for you. Hence you're the travelling dressmaker or the travelling tailor. For the system was wheels within wheels. 
and you gave them accommodation and food and that then would have been taken as per payment. And over the door is a photograph of Taylor Durkin. He was the tailor here in this area in the 40s, 50s, early 60s. The two ladies on the right are from Inish Man, one of the islands here off the coast. And the swan, of course, my mother was very much involved in knitting, sewing, crochet and crafts. And during the winter nights making fires and screens in the swan, there is an example of my mother's work, tapestry. Beautiful, isn't it? Mm. Mm. We did not have any sheep on this small holding of land. But during the summer when at home from school, my mother would get permission from family down the road here, Rad, allowing us to go down and we'd gather up all the wool then that was lashed in the briars, the bushes and the grass. Mm. We'd take that wool then home to my mother. She'd clean it, wash it and dry it. And then during the winter nights when our lessons were done, she'd have us carrying this wool. And our instructions were that we kept on combing it till we got all the fibres below the level of the teeth on the comb. Then you'd peel that wool off and you lay it on straight lines down the table. And later on then in the night, my mother would come along and she'd twist all those straight lines that we would have done into those wool ropes. And with those wool ropes then, she will make lumber rugs. Mm -hmm. And there's one that was never finished, was left there for us to have it. And those rugs then becoming blankets over us in bed. This here is a little apron that was given to me by a lady from Ballon Robe. This woman had a little brother within a legia, a child of God, meaning he was handicapped. This lady seemingly was fascinated by the apron worn by the traveller woman when she came begging. The traveller woman went back to the tent and she made him this little apron that the young lad held onto that God called him when he was 14. The sister having it and she's in her 70s now and she gave it to me and I asked her the meaning behind it. She said, a store, when you got a parcel from England or America, it wasn't too worried you were about the quality of the garment, but rather was there nice buttons on it or a nice belt. Mother, recognising that fascination, then saved the buttons and the brooches up and used them then on the garments of her children's clothes. And there isn't a shadow out here, she said, but those two have been taken from the garments of this woman's children's clothes. When she came begging, she wore a big apron. The apron then was covered with a shawl. She was looking for charity. The charity expected was food. Hence the magic then of her hand, she dropped it under the shawl, but it went into the apron pocket. Mm -hmm. And this is what was referred to as the traveller's pocket. And a few years ago, I had a senior citizens group with us from Galway. And when I lifted this up, this old lady, 80 years of age, said, Apron, a tinkery, a fluent Irish speaker. That's a tinker's apron, she said. I asked her, how did she know? She said, Misha Dukdo, a tinkery. I was the doctor to the tinkers. So I asked her what she knew of this. And she said, when they went around begging, they would find families extremely decent and kind to them. So they got from the lines of shiny buttons and brooches, sewed them onto the apron, and then instilled in the children to always respect those families. So really what we're seeing taking place here now is those buttons and brooches becoming family names for an illiterate part of society. Mm -hmm. And that principle has once again been adapted by people now involved in the teaching of special needs children. Dr. Conway McGee, Salt Hill. Mm -hmm. Just a piece here and then we're finishing the section. Here you have the mm -hmm. irons for ironing the clothes, heating those to the fire, mother to check it out that it was hot enough by spitting on it. Okay. And the speed at which the spit then hopped across the island, she was able to judge whether it was too hot for particular <laughs> garments to iron. To iron. Mm -hmm. Imagine this experience that went into that, that a human being could judge the temperature of the iron by spitting on it. <laughs> <laughs> Some had a box iron where you heated the bullet in the fire, closing it down with ashes then on the shower, uh, on the garment. This here is a tailor's iron called a tailor's goose. A tailor's goose short little one and I opted out of school when I was 13 but I had come in contact with all those trades on my way down to school at Calasso and right beside Calasso school was Taylor Brennan and right beside him was Joe Ginty in the forge which was the University of Life and in 1983 mm -hmm. Joe Ginty gave me this iron and he said that was Taylor Brennan's goose mm -hmm. and he also told me a story to go with it he said when Taylor Brennan was a young man starting out as a tailor he wanted to order two of those irons so he proceeded to write a letter to a company in Dublin who was supplying them Dear Sirs, I place an order with your company for the supply of two gooses, as I hope to start as a tailor soon. Mm -hmm. End of letter. Because he said he was, most, he was a very smart individual. He realised that the grammar was poor, and he thought the dubs would be laughing at him, so he shelved his idea. Two gooses, poor grammar. 
So days or weeks later, mm -hmm. he said he found out that the price of a goose was one and sixpence. So he then decided to write his letter, remembering that he wanted to all but two of them. Dear sirs, I placed an order with your company for the supply of a goose, as I hope to start as a tailor soon. I enclose a postal order for three shillings. Hope you'll send it on as soon as you can. John Brennan. Next line. P.S. Would you please forward a spare goose too? <laughs> <laughs> this here is also a tailor's iron, but it's an iron which you use mainly on Friday and Saturday. It is not a weekender, and it's not a gander but was the subject of a rhyme that you heard many, many times as children growing up that gave you the name of this iron, and it was a historical iron. Any idea what the rhyme was? It is not Goosey Goosey Gander. Mm. Mm. The rhyme was a half a pound of... Tuppen, tuppenny rice. Half a pound of tuppenny rice, a half a pound of treacle. Mm. That's the way the money goes. Not goes the weasel. Not goes the weasel. <laughs> and what was the meaning of that rhyme? Everyone has it. Yes. Mm. First one come from Europe. Mm. All right across, everybody has that rhyme. What was the meaning of it? Were they just words that mother put together to rock you to sleep? No, they have connection, rest assured, to, to a way of life. The weasel was the name of the iron. It was used by the tailor for ironing the suits for the gentry for the parties for the weekend, putting that heavy crease in the suit. Those suits were required on Friday and Saturday evening. And on Saturday evening, then the tailor got paid. When he got paid, he bought the necessities of life. He done the shopping. When he had the shopping done, there was a few pence left. And with a few pence left in his pocket on a Saturday evening, where did he go? The pub. <laughs> Another line in that rhyme told you so. Up and down the city road, in and out of the eagle. He went to the pub and he had a few pints. And I'm sure he went in on Sunday morning too. Mm. But reality kicked in for him on Monday morning. For a Monday morning, he was stone broke. Oh. And not a bob at him. Mm. He had a weasel that he had no work for, so the weasel had to go. Mm -hmm. The weasel was pawned. Hopefully, he'd be in a situation to redeem it then by Friday morning. Mm. So when he went to the pawn shop, the pawnbroker had it in for four days. He had to have it back by Thursday evening for to let it back, give the option back to the tailor to redeem it. But while he had it for the four days, he relet it. And he relet the iron to people working in hat factories. Hats were made from the material of. Felt. Um, mm. Felt. Yeah. Right? And when preparing it, there were traces of hairs to the felt. They used the iron to singe the hairs. Right? That's right. where they wanted the weasel, to singe the hairs. But before they singed the hairs, the treated the material was a liquid metal called? Mercury. Mercury. Good girl. Liquid mercury. Mm. So when he put the hot iron down, the mercury then gave off the fumes, the throbbing scatty, hence the expression, mad, you're as mad as a hatter. Mad hatter. Oh, oh, yes. 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 Yes.